it's funny. Introductions always say, make you seem a lot more important than you actually feel. Um, so thank you for coming out today. I'm going to move quite quickly because there's a lot of subject matter to cover. Um, if you haven't been to a spoken word poetry event before, um, it's totally acceptable when you hear poems to make sounds such as ahs, clicks, claps, whatever you want to do, just to let me know that you're actually vibing with my words and they're hitting home. Um, that being said, poetry can go some weird places. So my first one today actually starts off in my hometown of Christchurch, and I wrote it the afternoon of the, uh, the Christchurch incident uh, earlier this year. So this one's 51 flowers. March 15 marks the day a wasp stole the lives of 51 honeybees as they worshipped peacefully in their garden, simply because they did not look the same as he, but realizing we were also not the same. We, a nation that tend to our flowers in a slice of paradise, far from fields where mushroom clouds blossom on barren lands of intolerance. We, a nation small in number who raise our hands to help those who beg for refuge, only to then bury those people beneath our soil. May they rise again as flowers that we may all worship as one hive of many colors. To the wasp, an invasive species not from this land, I long to hate you for what you stand for, but I can't help but feel you're somehow familiar. The fear and intolerance entranced by the lightness of your yellow back, losing sight of how black your stripes had become. Now, I don't know a lot of wasps. They have a habit of blending in. But I know a lot of bees, many friends, family, and I know myself. So to our hive, I humbly ask, how may I remind you that the gardens which produce a land of milk and honey was planted upon mass graves? Land stolen from native owners, an invasive species when white supremacy was not broken promises of the treaty, but it was the treaty itself. Our problem is that white supremacy is not the wasp within our hive, it is the wax. It's maintained through actions and inactions, like when a student's dressed like a terrorist party involves a tea towel but never a skinhead, and their friend who knows better but not wanting to cause a scene stays silent and in doing so blends in. Too often, we fail to acknowledge that the real racists today aren't even really that racist. White robes and burning crosses are too dramatic, so instead they say, why can't we all be one New Zealand? Why can't the Inhumato protesters stop complaining and get a job instead? Or we say nothing. We drown our minds in the buzz until we're convinced that division is not what our country is about. But let me ask you, how many white supremacists were in the room when Te Reo was stripped from her people's lips? How many voted in Parliament on mandatory minimum sentences so juries can destroy families as easy as bullets? Yet we point to the wasp and say he does not represent us, rushing to ignore the fact that bees have stingers, zingers like, we're a Christian nation, and at least the terrorist was an Australian, desperate to distance ourselves from our own societal failings. But friends, the old wax is decaying, and we need to rebuild, rethink how to reconnect communities in a new world of extremism and digital isolation to help cure the sense of fear and frustration fueled by media manipulation before the next person reaches for a tool to impose their desperation on the next perceived invaders. My fellow bees, I ask that we recognize although this wasp was not from our hive, our backs too are colored yellow and black and we must face up to the fact that there is work to do. The first step is to admit there is a problem and not turn away from hate speech, but meet it with greater speech, conquering evil ideas, choosing strength over fear, and never bowing to it, conquering darkness with light in our blackest of hours, and lest we forget our 51 flowers. So I wanted to start with that piece because in, I was up in Rotorua at the time with a leadership group and we were really struggling to understand what had happened in this country. It's the first time we've been touched by that. But I didn't want to blame anyone and I didn't want to really give in to the sort of horrible nature. And art kind of gives us permission to explore these places, right? It, um, so this, we talk about loss and a little bit of that poem touched on the digital isolation that allowed this sort of group to come up um, of white supremacy in New Zealand. So what I wanted to take a look at today is how loss of identity personally and loss of connection with others and loss of our own voices has affected, I think, my life personally with uh, personal struggles with masculinity as well as how art can help us sort of reconnect and find those bridges to come together again. So I use poetry as a translator. 
much of what I say will go to any form of art, right? Doesn't matter if it's music, dance, whatever. Um, but I just choose poetry because that's the easiest for one for me to relate to. Next, we're going to have a look at some of the labels that A, we wear ourselves, and B, we put on others, and how that shuts down conversations. And finally, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work with young men, um, helping them rediscover their lost identities. Essentially, my work revolves around using poetry as a entry point to really difficult conversations. So I find myself writing a lot about gender, a lot about race, and especially like social equality, privilege, and power. Right? For example, if we look at the piece I just shared with you, I'm not trying to teach you anything you don't know. Like, I'm not trying to place blame on anyone, and I'm not trying to excuse it. All I'm trying to do is battle, essentially, with my own internal feelings and conflicts that were happening while this event was going on. I'm not the only person in this room that has probably felt at some point attacked, been misunderstood, or had some form of confrontation over a differing of a views and ideas that turned personal, right? Like social media is an echo chamber and comment sections are absolutely brutal. So I'm probably also not the only one who's struggled to talk to people. My father, for example, um, we have many political differences. He is an avid Trump supporter. But if I was to only categorize him as that, I'd miss who he is as a character and the impact he's had on my life and how he shaped who I am today. So to say that although we disagree on many things, I still have to work to understand his point of views and listen, because ignoring it, although it is easier, leads to further him reaffirming his views, thinking that no one thinks differently but also me not having the opportunity to potentially learn from other things he's experienced and why he holds those views. So that's essentially why I choose poetry. It's non-confrontational and it finds ways to bridge between two different opposing viewpoints. Now what we just did with this one is and poetry essentially helps us to reframe the issues and take someone out of their own head. It's the same with all art. You get them to step back from the moment and look at it from a different perspective. Using the flowers, the wasps, and the bee images, it takes away from the horror that was everything that happened in March. Um, it allows you to sort of reflect on our society in a way that means you don't feel like you're being personally criticized for your part in it. Um, yeah, and by using art instead, it means you are able to cut off any sort of objections, you present a piece for them to be discussed, you don't, you don't blame anyone, right? It's just easy to have that conversation started. And that's essentially it. It's not a debate you're having, it's art, and it's holding and creating a space. All we do in art, if you're a member in high school, right, you probably learned about abstract and concrete language, where abstract is that ephemeral sort of floaty language, and concrete is something you experience with your five senses. So you taste it, touch, feel, all the rest. Um, all I try to do, really, as a poet, is to take these abstract concepts and find thoughtful and creative ways to make them concrete. So when we talk about racism, power, white supremacy, those are all abstract, right? You can't touch them. So how do I make it concrete? That's where we go into white supremacy isn't the wasp, it's the beehive and the wax. How do we then get them to relate it to what's actually happening in their real life and kind of slip it past their guides? We know the stories of the KKK with the white robes and burning crosses, so we acknowledge that and then step them back and say, yeah, that's dramatic. What does it look like in the New Zealand context? And then we had those examples, like, why can't we be one New Zealand? And then it starts building that idea that these are similar ideas, they're just less extreme, but the undercurrent that ties them together is there. So, Essentially, you might understand that racism itself is bad. What I want to do is get you to essentially open your hearts up to it in a way that allows it to sort of soak in and be something that you carry with you beyond the point of hearing the poem and just reframe and reshape how you see the society. I want you to internalize it and not just intellectually understand it. Poetry allows us to zoom in and make things personal. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given was 
when you're starting out in poetry, don't write about the things that are common, write about the things that scare you most, because then that's how people will connect with you. You bring it home. So you don't write about massive concepts. Like to write about war is difficult because there's so much to it. But you can write about the first time you walk into your brother's empty room. Bring it home and make it hit. Um, I choose poems in my life, and I'm fortunate or unfortunate to have quite a few interesting moments that invites you, my audience, to join me on a journey and see things through my eyes and how I walk New Zealand in the world as a biracial New Zealander. This is something that potentially you haven't experienced, or if you do, then maybe it affirms your journey and says you're not alone in that. A really great thing that, uh, in preparing for this, I had this wave of self-doubt that I kept going to my friends about, and it was because I kept thinking that in order to have value in my words to actually mean something and leave you with something valuable, I had to be someone, right? Like I had to, like there's got to be a professor in art who can express this better, or someone who has more followers on Instagram, something that could capture it. But essentially, you don't have to be perfect to show up, whether you're an activism artist or anything. If you have a voice, just start saying it, and eventually you'll find yourself in front of a creative morning audience. Um, one thing art does allow us to do through sharing our story is the permission to free ourselves from a binary thinking, right? You don't have to have the answers. We get away from right wrongs, um, problem solution. Like you're freed from that and you can just present a point of view and open up a space for people to discuss things. The only premise to that is you need to make sure it comes from a place of authenticity and that you care about the people you're working with because otherwise they'll see through that in a heartbeat. When it comes to uh, sort of talking about spaces, someone clever told me that we're merely as artists holding the door open for others to walk through. When we create the spaces, the goal isn't to put myself or others out there to lead people towards my desired outcome, right? It's to create and hold a space for you to explore yourself and talk amongst each other to compare your own experiences. All we do is we serve them and we support their journey. The big part of that, obviously, is collaboration. Uh, there's that myth of like the capital A artist who goes away and lives in a mountain top for like five years and comes back with this novel or beautiful painting. And I think that's the biggest lie you can tell. Because what I've learned is poetry is not a fluid thing. Like the number of times I've taken pieces to friends and bounced idea, had coffees, and just talked through our ideas and collaborated, that's where it comes from. You don't create great art in a vacuum. Um, and also, it's not about you or me individually or our identities and people. It's about what we do uh, collaboratively as a team or group that really starts to connect people again and free ourselves from those lost identities. It's more important to work with other people than to fight against them and try and convince them that your point of view is right. Because often when you beat someone in an argument, how often do they then want to work with you? It's better to have a conversation with them, convince them if you can, adjust your own thinking if you need to, and then work towards a common outcome later. One of the funny things is uh, it's often seen as like changing your mind is so difficult and so bad, but I think it's actually a really good sign of emotional intelligence and, emotion and uh, intellectual curiosity to accept that, you know what, at the start of this conversation, I believed X, and now because of this, I understand a little bit more and I'm open to having other viewpoints. I don't think anyone would ever consider you ignorant if you're able to change your mind, so long as you're willing to accept that when they change theirs, you don't say, Gotcha, I'm right, I win. It's not a victory, it's not a fight. It's a conversation and it's collaboration. One of my uh, best mentors I met who had a lot to do with changing my life, and you'll hear a little bit about in the poem I'll share at the end of this, um, was that it's so essential to love the person even if you don't support their actions and views or perspective, right? My father has very different views to mine. That does not mean that I hold it against him, I don't judge him, and I don't... Uh, hate him for those. I just try and love him as a person. Like, 
We're going to talk about labels very shortly, and we'll dive a little bit more into that. But this is a quote that's always stuck with me and tried to sort of guide the way I live my life. So this is baby Hugh. Um, Ninja Turtles are dope. I work as a marketer and a mentor, and one thing I see so often is isolation is everywhere now. We're, ironically, we're more connected. We all have cell phones, we can talk to people on the other side of the world just like that. It's not an issue. But also, in doing that, we've become more isolated, and that doesn't really make sense. I kind of blame marketers such as myself. How many people in the room are social media marketers? None. Okay, a little bit? Cool. So, when you look at your Facebook feeds, if you swapped phones with the person next to you, you're going to be seeing a very different set of adverts, right? And that's because I can get super targeted and to like a creepy level going after you. I can tell you, if your birthday is today, I can hit you with adverts that are, this is your birthday week leading up to it, or your friends just got engaged, I can hit you with, are you feeling lonely? Here's a dating site. It's really easy to break people apart based on their, their needs and desires. And there are algorithms and Facebook has made it easier than ever. They've idiot-proofed segmentation. And in doing that, what it's done is it's created an environment where you get an echo chamber. I, or rather social media, will show you the viewpoints that agree with yours that are most likely to drive clicks. And they will hide from you opposing opinions. There's a reason I follow both Fox News and CNN in the States, because I want to see what both sides are seeing, and I also want to mess with the algorithm, because I don't like them doing that with my data and profiling me so easily. Um, so, we, and we see the outcome of these everywhere. Like, you have, in the States, it's the worst case. You have red and blue, two political teams, they will never agree, and the people, like, the protests, the pro-Trump, anti-Trump, if they were able to look past the fact they're Democrat or Republican, a lot of them would probably have the same fears about their country, but because they've labeled each other so heavily, they can't have that conversation anymore. And I do have the fear of New Zealand that we may end up going the same way if we're not very conscious of this. So taking a look at some of my own labels, I did an experiment with some of my friends to consider the labels, I thought about the labels I put on myself when I carry, the ones that they put on themselves and they have put on me, and then other things I've been called throughout my life. So these are the ones I generally walk through the world. I was born and Baby Hugh came out with this. Um, first born, brother came later. Um, I have a like, lovely sister who's slightly younger. Um, I'm Asian, straight, cis man, all the rest, right? Those are things that are just, they're there, they're part of me. Then there's things that other people have described me as. And fortunately, my friends told me mostly positive things, but I'm guessing that if you asked other people, they might not be as positive, and that's just being honest about the way we interact with people, right? And finally, there's the thing that strangers uh, on the internet say about us, as well as people who've heard your reputation but never met you. Those are a little bit hard to look at. But what I guess has become quite evident is when you first saw me, you saw baby Hugh, right? Exactly as I am and how I want to be perceived. The problem now is that there are so many labels that are above him, you can't see the person beneath. And when you think about having conversations with difficult people or people that you don't necessarily agree with, you've got to remember that under all that, they still have a baby or an innocent version of themselves that also has fears, hopes, dreams, the rest of it. And your frame and your perspective, you need to just be conscious of those labels you've placed in front of them. Um, yeah, does that make sense? So, how do we counter it? I think we treat our labels the same way we treat clothing. Like, take it on, put it on, like, take it off, put it on as required, depending on the situation. You'd never consume me or my body for my shirt or who I am. But it's so easy to assume that the labels of a person are reflective of their identity. Uh, Warren, my mentor, once told me, you need to be careful through which mirrors you view yourself. And I'd also build on that and say you need to be careful of the labels you place in front of other people or at least be conscious of them. Um, one of the ones I was thinking about in writing the bio for this, uh, this event was if I described myself as a feminist in the title, I have a feeling that would have shaped the way you saw me. Likewise, if I'd said I'm a men's rights activist, 
that instantly brings to mind a whole lot of preconceptions based on angry people shouting on the street, right? And if I'd done either of those things, possibly I may have attracted more people or less, which is why I'm grateful that you all showed up regardless. Um, so final stage is talking a little bit about masculinity. We're coming to the end of November. Um, it's a hard thing to talk about as guys. Like the number of times I've talked to friends like Max about this um, in the gym is just, it's tough being a guy these times and it's tough to talk about it. Now, although I am a feminist, I also care about men's rights, right? And to focus on talking about this subject doesn't discount the struggles that women go through in our society. It's just to acknowledge that guys are also battling right now with a sense of identity and where we fit. I found a Washington Post article last night with quotes from trans men who transitioned from female bodies to men and how they were experiencing it. One of the ones that really stuck out to me was, what continues to strike me is the significant reduction in friendliness and kindness now extended to me in public spaces. It feels as though I'm on my own. No one outside my friends and close family is paying any attention to my well-being or happiness. And that hit me because what I've seen working with sort of, I work with like kids from 12 to about 18-ish, right? A really vulnerable age for, for young men. Um, especially the ones who, they're kind of the throwaway kids, the ones who are removed from class for being too violent or disruptive. Um, and a lot of them are quite broken and they don't know how to fix themselves. But taking it back from that, because we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, um, was another quote that I'll leave you with on this one, was a couple of years after my transition, I had a grad student I'd been mentoring. She started coming on to me, stalking me, sending me emails and texts. My, advi my advisor and the dean, who were both women, laughed it off. I was worried that if the student I felt, uh, if the student felt I was not returning their attention, she'd claim that I had assaulted her. I felt like as a guy, I was not taken seriously. I'd experienced harassment as a female person at another university and they'd reacted immediately, sending police escorts with me to and from the campus. Recently, I was interviewing for a junior member of my team and my manager said, maybe you should bring one of the female members of staff in there with you. And it kind of broke me a little bit because I've never considered that. I'm a young manager, right? And as such, she saw the vulnerability that I was exposing myself to by interviewing candidates one-on-one. -on -one. And so was protecting me. And I didn't think to protect myself from that. And that to me was terrifying. Um, I'm also really aware that as guys, it's quite easy to lose your voice. I was really scared of this presentation because I know like, A, it's recorded and it goes onto the internet and I'm one soundbite away from being mislabeled and blasted for being anti-women or anything else. Um, and that's really scary to speak up about by saying I appreciate and value men's rights. That is so often taken out of context and it's really scary to have that stripped from you when you do uh, if you do lose your voice, which I've experienced in the past. Over the years, we've all been told how to be real men. I think any guy in here would be able to list off the characteristics, strong, sexually experienced, confident, like makes money, supports a family, all the rest of it, right? And in doing that and in putting those labels on us, I think what we've forgotten how to do is, redis or we've lost how to be individuals in ourselves. Like we know the archetypal man, but what we've forgotten is actually there are many versions of masculinity out there and all of them are equally valid, whether you're the quiet indoor kid that plays video games or you're the hunter who heads out in the weekend with his brothers. A lot of the masculine traits that used to be really healthy and things that were looked up to have been distorted. Um, you'll hear some in the poem shortly, but things like uh, being strong, right, physically strong, used to be valuable because it was about protecting the things and the people you cared most about. But then that changed over time and became being strong is about dominating other people and expressing your power over other people who are weaker, whether they be uh, other sexualities or women. And it's how do we recapture and reclaim that, uh, that original meaning and those values and say, you know what? 
a lot of what I do with young men is to teach them that their masculinity and who they are as individuals is not innately toxic. That's just the extreme versions that they've been taught and we need to deprogram. So when I say that men sometimes need safe spaces, often it gets laughed off. But we have a lot of deprogramming to do. Years and years we've been told how to be real men. And women figured it out real quick that being told what a real woman is, and like it sucks, and fought back against it. But guys are a little bit slower at times, and so we're just figuring this out now. So we need to create safe spaces for us so we can be wrong, so we can make mistakes without ending up as headlines. So despite the uh, happy photo in the previous uh, image of me and my parents, um, I grew up in a very hyper-masculine environment. My mother escaped the Thai Mafia when she was young, and my father is ex-military. Um, that kind of shaped who I was, and they didn't raise me good or bad, right? It, it's not about that. They raised me the only way they knew men should be. So with that, I'd like to present you with a poem that I generally start with when I open up conversations with young guys to sort of crack them open and start the conversations about masculinity. When it comes to my masculinity, my history genetically predisposed me to see emotions as weakness because I carry with me ghost stories of warriors from my family's past that whisper intimacy was never meant to be part of my chemistry. I am one part mafia, one part military. Violence was bred into me and my early lessons in masculinity taught me that tears over accidentally broken bones meant I'd have to wait until morning before visiting the infirmary. So at the age of 11, I stopped crying. I became an amalgamation of sticks and stones that replaced my bones. I was all teeth but no smile, all fists but no fingers. A landmine rattling quietly down streets lined with crystal houses made of happy memories I wanted to visit, but didn't in case I broke them accidentally. My house? A bulletproof bomb shelter built to make me feel safe and stop my parts from bursting out. So I kept fears inside of a cage. Because real men don't talk about their feelings, right? They're all about the physical, physical strength, physical appearance, and physical labor using that physicality to have lots of sex. But you know, only with women, because no homo, bro. Place 170 kg in front of me, and I know how to lift that shit up, but ask me to carry a broken heart or the weight of a happily never after, and I'll look at you with confusion. Because it wasn't in the instruction manual, or maybe it was, I didn't read it. I was taught to be a real man before I was allowed to be a boy. All firm handshakes and stiff upper lips, and as I... As years passed, I began to resent this fragile prison of masculinity in which I'd been placed and never thought to escape, cellmates with a sadness which embraced me tight, telling me that it was all okay, and although I was not all right, if Batman could get through this manly shit, then so can I, powered only by solar-powered confidence becoming a wreck on dark nights. Until one day I met a friend who was so full of light having lost his son to masculinity, he chose to help me learn how not to be the man, but instead to rediscover myself. So when his strong hands reached down to help me climb free of my bomb shelter, through his vulnerability, I learned that although I felt like half the man I could be and one-tenth of the man I should be, I was still closer to being a good man than I'd ever been. We too often think of masculinity as a source of shame. Young boys looking through a toxic mirror frame, confusing strength with domination, bravery with recklessness, protection with aggression, coolness with coldness, a desire to win with victory at any cost, even when the cost is everything for nothing. So now as a man, I hold my masculinity up as one example of the many that men can be. Preaching to boys that we men are not afraid of emotions. It's okay to be soft sometimes and to be strong in a way that is not about physical strength. And that the power of a man is not that he can fight, but the causes he chooses to fight to protect. And it's okay to cry and no matter what anyone may say, it's so fucking okay to love themselves. So that's a little bit of my journey with masculinity.